course, you are now leaving El Jihad al Asghar. You're leaving the lesser jihad for El Jihad al Akbar, the greater jihad. So his companions said they were they were confused for a second because in those days people were fighting hand to hand combat, close. You see people dismembered, broken bones, swords, bows and arrows, uh, fists. Not, not this type of warfare we have today where someone can press a button and a missile goes 2,000 miles away and people get killed, you don't even see the people. This type of warfare back then. So they were wondering, and they asked the Prophet Muhammad, Mel Jihad al-Akbar, what is the greatest jihad? What's greater than this? Muhammad the Prophet said, Jihad al nafs It is the jihad with inside of yourself. It's, it's the jihad within inside of yourself against sin and corruption. This is the greatest jihad. And this is the jihad that we Muslims are supposed to be involved in every single day to improve ourselves and to resist those things that would lead us to having immoral and unethical behaviors. Striving against sin and corruption. This is the greatest jihad uh, according to uh, the teachings of Islam. So jihad does not mean holy war. There is no word called al-khabul muqaddasa in our text. In the Quran, there's no such word. As a matter of fact, in the Quran itself, God says that it has been made incumbent upon you to fight, meaning to defend yourself, even though you dislike it, because war is ugly. War is ugly. People don't want to leave, leave their, their homes and leave their families and see the, the ugliness of war. People don't love that. I mean, intrinsically, human beings don't love war. This is uh, the difference. There is no quote-unquote so-called holy war. That term does not exist. This is a misnomer and a, mis, a mistranslation done by the media. This word doesn't exist in our text. As a matter of fact, I think one of our organizations, uh, uh, that's a different word, that's the word infidel. That word doesn't exist in the Quran either. The next term I want to get to is the term sharia. And then, uh, that was the last term, now I'll stop for the Q&A. Sharia, in its root meaning, in its, in its regular meaning, simply means a path towards water. It means a path towards water. And just, the Quran uses the term Sharia only one time. Now, the Arabic language is very interesting because the Qur'an itself is to be understood in its original language that it was revealed in, which is Arabic. Now, four, 1400 years ago, when an Arab heard this term Sharia as it was given in the Qur'an, I want to go into the psychology of the people of that time. If you're in a desert and you know of an oasis or somewhere that has some water, that path towards there is essential for your very life. Because without water, living in hot areas in the desert, you surely will die. For your camel, your camel needs water so that your water can survive because your camel is not only what you ride and carry goods, you also get milk from your camel. And the water is something that helps refresh you and it helps you to clean those things that have gotten dirty from being in the desert in the sand. So the path towards that water is one of the most important things in your life if you're an Arab in the desert of the Arabian Peninsula. So just as the human being needs this water physically to survive, to maintain its life, the soul of a human being needs a type of spiritual water. It needs something to sustain itself spiritually and intellectually. And Sharia 
simply means a path towards faithfulness or a path towards a human being living their life for the pleasure of God. This is what Sharia really means, and that all of the life, all of the life um, is for God. All of the life is for God. Now, Sharia does not mean strict Islamic law. This is a misunderstanding. There is no set codex. Sharia does not mean a set codex of Islamic law. There is no one book any Muslim can go to and say, this is a Sharia. This does not exist. This is, this is, this is not in existence. It doesn't, it doesn't exist. The Sharia in itself regulates basically three things within the life of the human being, and it has five objectives. The five, I mean, the, the, the three parts it regulates are first, those things relating worship, relating to worship, that are between the human being and the creator solely. Like praying, or how someone prays, or fasting, and when one fasts. Like no one can, no one can regulate for you, or me, or no one can tell when you're fasting when I'm fasting. Like I told you, fasting from dawn to dusk. I can tell anyone I'm fasting, then go into the back room and sneak a Snickers bar and a pop. No one would know, but God knows. There's nothing that can be regulated and enforced by men. This is part of the Sharia. Praying. Seeing someone who's homeless and no one's around and giving them charity. This is, no one knows about this. This is, the, this is between the individual and God about you giving that charity in secret putting it in the collection box somewhere uh, when no one is around. So these are between God and, 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 and the human being. Then there are certain laws or guidance regarding social transactions. So the, uh, called mu'amalat in Arabic. I'm saying this for the benefit of my Iraqi friend right there. Um, Social transactions. What type of social transactions and social interactions can we have and, and that we don't have? Some of those have implications that can be regulated in a governmental system and some of them can't. For instance, compound interest called riba in the Arabic language is prohibited for Muslims. We're not supposed to charge people compound interest, nor are we supposed to take compound interest. This is forbidden in Islam. Now, if it's legal in the society, or someone wants to charge someone compound interest, there's no, no way to stop it, but it's something between the person. God knows whether you charge someone uh, like a loan shark and charge them 50%, you gave them $100, and on payday, they have to come back and give you $150. These things are, 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 are things between the individual and God, but there are other things that have social implications that have to be regulated regarding commerce. The last three of these things are judgments and punishments that we believe that, um, though the Quran gives very few, we believe that in society there must be a judicial system because without govern without governance and without a judiciary, there is anarchy and injustice. Societies have to have a means of people being able to voice grievances in a legal process and for there to be judgments and awards if someone has had their property rights violated or if someone commits criminal acts, there has to be some type of punishment or criminality, or else there will be total anarchy in society. And all civil societies believe in the rule of law and order. Now these are the, the basics of Sharia. Now as I mentioned, Sharia is not a set codex of law. But in Islam, we have different schools of thought of what's called fiqh. Fiqh is, means jurisprudence. 
that call me jurisprudence in Islam. And amongst the Sunnis, there are four different schools of jurisprudence. Amongst the Shia,